Hello, I'm Dr. Oleg Hammerdiner. Welcome to Discrete Event Simulation. This is Lecture 25, Further Statistical Issues. I will talk about random number generation, generating random variates, non-stationary Poisson processes, variance reduction, sequential sampling, and also designing and executing simulation experiments. So let's start talking about random number generators, abbreviated as RNGs. A random number generator is an algorithm to generate independent, identically distributed draws from continuous, uniform random distribution with uh, parameters 0 and 1. So it's a distribution between with the mass being um, focused on the interval from 0 to 1. So you can see the probability density function plot right here and this is where you see that the main mass right is uniformly distributed on this interval from 0 to 1. So the um, numbers right or draws that are produced by this algorithm is are called random numbers and they are often uh, the key in simulation. And uh, this random number generator is the basis for generating observations not just from this uniform uh, zero um, distribution from zero to one, but also from all other distributions in random processes. And this is possible because we can actually transform random numbers in a way that depends on desired distribution or process. And by transforming it, uh, we can change it into a random variable or a random process that fits our desired distribution. And because of that, it's very important for us to have a good random number generator. Of course, there's a lot of bad random number generators because it's it's very very tricky to create an algorithm that works uh, very well and not only the methods are complicated but also the coding can create some problems as well so the coding is quite tricky as well so when we want to talk about random number generators we need to discuss um, the, their nature and how they're produced. So the, the way the a random number generator works to produce random numbers is it creates or uses a recursive formula which is the heart of the algorithm. And in this formula we start with a seed or uh, sometimes a seed vector. And then we do something um, strange or unusual um, to some degree to the seed and in order to get a next uh, value. And then we repeat this process um, to generate um, same sequence and eventually it will repeat itself, the sequence of numbers that we generate will repeat itself and we call this thing cycling, right, so if we will get the cycle and so we want a long cycle length so again, as you, if you see that, um, what I just described, right, this algorithm is not really random, right, in, in the way that it's not um, unpredictable. It's actually, right, because the uh, sequence will repeat itself, we can kind of say, okay, you know, at a certain time, we're going to start seeing the same numbers again. So the question is, does this really matter? first of all, from the philosophical perspective, but more importantly, practically, right? In practice, is it gonna affect our simulation? So we want to design the random number generators that has good properties, right? That where it doesn't look so non-random, right? Where the numbers that are produced by our algorithm actually appear random, right? Even though we, don't, we know that they are not, technically random, but they, in some way, you know, they 
look almost the same as if they were randomly produced variables. So one of the key things that we want um, is we want the long cycle lens, right? We want our algorithm to be able to produce this long cycle lens. Well, I'll ask you why? Why do we need the cycle lens to be long? Of course, right? If we if we have a short cycle length, then what happens is that after that short cycle length, we start seeing the same numbers again. And so that's a problem because then our numbers really don't look very random at all. In fact, right, we we see that they're we basically get the same number over and over, the same number over and over after a certain number of steps. So you know, if we can see that uh, very easily, then of course the numbers, the generated numbers, do not appear very random. Also, we want good statistical properties, right? Because we assume, right, that the numbers that we are getting are uniformly distributed and they're also independent, right? So we know in reality that there it's not completely this way, right? Because these are not really the random numbers, but if they look very similar, as I said, right, to some random numbers, if we cannot really distinguish it, we cannot apply some statistical test to test the uniform distribution. And if they, based on that test, if we cannot um, say that they definitely don't come from the uniform distribution, then that's good enough for us, right? So we could do some statistical tests for uniform and independence. And as long as those tests do not reject the hypotheses of uniform distribution and independence, then we're still good. So because of that, right, we want to have those random numbers that would not be rejected by these tests of uniform and, dis and independence. And also, right, if we're generating our numbers, we're generating them so that we can later use them in simulation. So if our algorithm is slow for generating the random numbers, then of course our simulation is going to be even more slow. And so it's very important for us to have the random number generators that are fast. And also, and that's a little more tricky, is we want to have streams, streams or sub-segments. And we want to have them, uh, many of those streams, and we also want to have these streams being long, right? And this is important for uh, the purpose of um, variance reduction. And I'll talk to about it later more. Uh, so these streams are key because these streams allows us, right, to pick a specific stream, right, and start from a specific stream, right, and then being able to synchronize different uh, simulation or simulation runs, right, and that will help in variance reduction. So as you can see, right, everything that I described, right, it's not so easy, right, to come up with an algorithm that would right away satisfy all these properties, right? In fact, this is very hard, right? Doing something strange, right, and unusual isn't just enough for us to be able to to um, get the numbers, right, that would work in this in this way. And so one of the things that is often talked about, and is in fact one of the uh, commonly used random number generators, is linear congruential generator, or LCG. And as I mentioned, right, it's most common of several different methods for generating random numbers. But right, it's not the method that is used um, right now in Arena. It, also, this method is, is related, and I'll show you when we talk about the one that is used in the arena, I'll show you how it is related. So, the way this linear congruential generator work is that it generates a sequence of integers that we can denote as zeta sub 1, zeta sub 2, and so on, and it uses a recursion to generate it. And the specific recursion that is used is given by this formula. Right, so you can see that each consecutive value uh, zeta sub i is computed based here, right, based on this formula that includes the previous value, right, the previous integer zeta i minus 1. 
And we also have these numbers, right, the A, C, and M, and these are the parameters for the algorithm. And those are very carefully chosen constants. So when we look at the uh, way to start it, is we first need to specify a seed, right? So we need to specify a first number zeta zero that we can plug in here to get a first integer in our sequence. So the zeta, ear, uh, z, uh, zeta sub zero is a seed that we're using to start off our recursive algorithm. And important other thing is we're using this modulus m. So the modulus m, as you can see here, right? So you have a multiplied by the previous value of uh, in the sequence z plus c, and then this expression is then uh, we use modulus m, right? So modulus m means that we divide the expression by m and then we use the remainder. Uh, so we use the remainder of, of that division. And so when you look at this, right, if you're using the rem remainder of m, the remainder of m could be 0, 1, 2, and so on, right, but it's going to be less than m. So the last integer less than m is m minus 1. So zi's are always going to be between 0 and m minus 1. So if you look at this, right, this basically means, right, that we, we could have 0, uh, 1, and so on, m minus 1, so m different values for zi's that we can get. And so we actually, right, uh, in order to get the random value between 0 and 1, what we have to do right, is to divide it by m. And so to get the ith random number, we write this uniform random number uh, u sub i, we divide the zeta i, or zeta sub i, by m. So now let's take a look at an, two example of uh, the linear congruential generator, and we choose our uh, parameters to be m is going to be 63, so you can see why this is a toy one, right? This is quite a small number m, and then a is 22, c is 4, and z is 19, right? If we have a 63, we, it's not as, right, it's only we have 63 different values possible. It's not as uniform, right, because we can only get those points um, through the 63, right? So we actually using the discrete values to get the um, uniform distribution that's continuous. And so, right, again, as I mentioned, this is a toy example with a pretty small value m. So let's take a look at this, this uh, generator, right? So this generator, random number generator, uh, it uses the sequence zi, right? So the z to i or zi sequence Right, because a is 22, so you can see here 22 multiplied by the previous value in the z, zeta sequence plus the c, which is 4. And then, right, we're using the modulus division uh, by 63, so we're going to get the remainder of the division by 63. And here, of course, you know, it will depend on the seed that we choose, right? If we choose a different seed, it's going to give us a different sequence. So here we've chosen a seed zeta sub zero equals to 19. So here I'm gonna use this table and fill out the table with the values of sequence zi and also with the corresponding uh, random number ui, random numbers ui. So you can see here, right, we start with i, this is our value, right, that we have here in our recursive formula. Then it's divided by 63 using modular division, and then this is zi is the remainder of the division. And then dividing z, zi by m, which is 63, right, we're going to get the ui. And the uis will always be between 0 and 1, and actually going to be um, smaller than 1. Right, so now we get, if we start with i0, and zeta sub zero is 19, right? This is our seed. So right away we can put plugins in 19. We're not using this formula because, right, 
this is we start with i equals zero, right? And this would give us minus minus one. So the next thing is going to start generating the numbers for us. So we're using the seed number. We finally start with one. Then we plug in this 19 right here. So 22 plus uh, 19, sorry, not plus, multiply by 19, and then plus 4 is 422. So then what we're going to do is we're going to divide this by 63. And so dividing it by 63, we're going to get... 44 as a mo as a remainder of that. Um, so here, just to demonstrate, right? I have 22. I multiply it by 19, and then I to 418. I'm gonna add four, right? So just to compute this, right? And it's exactly 422, right? And so the next thing, right, is I can divide it by um, 63. So if I divide it by 63, right, I'm going to get this value, right? So the integer division, right, gives me this value. So I can, uh, for example, subtract 6 there. And this is the rest of it, of rest of it right? And then multiply back by 63 will, should give me the remainder, right? So that's exactly what I got. I just got the remainder. Right, this 44. And so then from 44, I divide this by 63. And this is what I get, right? Of course, you know, I only have four significant digits after the decimal point. So this is my value. So this is my random number. And it's between 0 and 1. So the next thing, right, is gonna I'm going to be using this Z1 as my next seed. To compute the two, right? So now, right, when I compute the two, right, I'm gonna plug in, right, 22 multiplied by 44, and then this is gonna be this, and then plus 4, and this is if we just using this formula here, and so I get 972, right? And so that's exactly what we see here. Right, we see 972. And then, of course, again, I use the division. So let me use a division. So divided by 63, I'm going to get this. So I get rid of my 15, only have the fractional part, which will lead me to the remainder. So I subtract my integer part, multiply back to 63 to get the remainder. Of course, there's a different ways to do it. I get my remainder of 27. And so that's my Z2, Z sub 2. And then from Z sub 2, I can get my random number U sub 2 by dividing by 63. So I'm going to divide this by 63. And now you can see, right, 0 0.4285. Well, actually 86, right, because this is ends with 7. So we're going to uh, approximate it. So uh, 0.4286 and and so on right so I'm not going to demonstrate it all the time I'm just going to show what what the results are so again uh, what I'm doing is I'm using 27 right I'm plugging it in here and that will give me z z3 right because this was z2 now I'm using it in this formula to get uh, me to z3 so I'll get 598 as this evaluates to 598 and then I divided by 63, modular division, and I find the remainder, right? So the remainder is 31 of our division. And then divide the remainder by 63, and that gets me to this. And so I continue doing this, right? And I do that for a while. Uh, eventually, I'll get to my 61st, ZI, Z sub 60, 61 is going to be 32 and then u sub 61 61st right is going to be 0 0.5079 and then when i start again with 62 i'll get 708 get 15 here this is point uh, 2381 
and on the 63rd I'll get 3, 3, uh, 334 as, as this value, right? And then dividing it by modular division of 63, I get the remainder of six, division by 63 is 19, right? And so this is 0. Point, right? The U, UI is 0. 0.3016. And so you can see, right, this 19, the reason why it's highlighted is because it wrapped around, right? Now we know that as soon as we reach this 19, we're going to continue seeing the same numbers, right? Because when we plugged in the first time, when we plugged in this 19 here, this is what we got. We got 42, 422, and then that leads us to the next being 44. And that's exactly what happens, right? We get this 19. We plug it in here, we again gonna get this 422. There is no other number that we can get from using 19 in this formula. And so you can see, right, again, we got 44, we got this, right? It's just gonna continue repeating, right, in the same exact sequence, right? So we only got 63 new values, right? And then on the 63rd, it wrapped around and restarted itself the sequence in the same exact order as it was before. So what you see here is cycling, right? So this will repeat forever. So we're not going to generate anything new, right? And you can see that the cycle length is always less or equal than M, right? If you're using this linear congruential generator, it will always, the cycle length will always be less or equal than M. In this case, it's, it's exactly M, but sometimes it could be smaller, right? Even smaller. And so that illustrates that even right, those linear congressional generators, they are tricky. All right, so again, as I mentioned, right, could be less, significantly less than M, depending on the parameters. So we want to typically pick a large M, right? It should be big so that our cycle length is big. Uh, but that might not be enough, right? Why? Because we also need good statistical properties. And... Right, even if we get the big large M, it still might not work for us, right? Because it might not satisfy some of those uniform and independence properties. And so, right, when you look at some of the issues with linear congruential, congruential generators, right? First of all, the cycle length is always less or equal than M. And so, typically M equals to 2.1 billion, right? So that's approximately 2 to the 31st minus 1, right? Or even larger. So, which used to be a lot, right? It used to be a lot, uh, but um, now that things run faster and computers run much faster, it can be exhausted much faster, this kind of large cycle lens. So other parameters chosen so that the cycle lens, right, equals to m or m minus 1, and when you look at the statistical properties, right, we desire the uniformity and dependence, right? There are many tests for random number generators. Some of them are empirical tests, some theoretical tests, for example, looking at the lattice structure. And you'll see that I'll show you in, in a second. Um, another thing, right, that is a pr big problem with linear congruential generators is the speed and storage, right? Both are usually fine, uh, but must be carefully, very cleverly coded, right? And the reason why is because we need to use these M that is large, so it produces very big integers. And those large in or big integers can often result in the buffer overflow errors, right? And so those numerical errors can happen, uh, and that could, you know, of course, not produce the result that we need to produce. Another thing is reproducibility, right? We, we need the streams uh, or long internal subsequences with fixed, uh, fixed seeds. So again, sir, the issues that I wanted to illustrate that arise with linear congruential generators, one of the issues um, that is well known is regularity of the LCGs. Um, and regularity is not only the uh, situation that happens with LCGs, but also other kinds of random number generators. Um, so if you look at the um, earlier toy example that we just did in, in a few slides, 
before, right? If you plotted the values of our random numbers u sub i versus the i, this is what we're going to get. So you can see this lattice, very clear lattice structure there. And if you plotted u i plus 1 versus u i, you also see this lattice structure as well, right? And so that's, of course, right, uh, tells you that they are not really random, right? There is a certain structure that you can e clearly observe. And so random numbers fall mainly in the planes, right, as the, was the famous quote by George Marsoglia. And this is because, right, you can see that what you get is, is you get this kind of very structural um, relationships, right, between those random numbers, right, and just in terms of the sequence and in terms of the nearby random numbers. So when we look in terms of the design of random numbers generators, right, we want dense lattice in high dimensions. So we, we it all would look very uniform, right, and, and kind of random. So other kinds of random number generators, right, would uh, lead to longer memory and recursion combination of several uh, random number generators could be used. So um, original uh, random number generator used in ARENA was uh, circa 1983, and it was uh, actually a um, linear congruential generator with um, parameter m equal to 2 to 31 minus 1, right? So this huge 2 billion number. And at that time, it was actually fine, right? And the a was 7 to the fifth. So that evaluates to 16,807, and C was zero. Uh, so it it's, was working quite fast, right? It has this large uh, cycle lens of 2.1, right, to the um, 10, to, 10 to the ninth, right? So it's over 2 billion uh, numbers you can generate before it wraps around. So another thing that was good was uh, we could produce 10 different automatic streams with fixed seeds. And um, at that time, right in the 1980s, it was actually a good well-tested generator and an efficient code. But right, unfortunately, or fortunately, current computer speeds, right, make this cycle lens inadequate, right? So it, it gets, right, because the computer com uh, calculate things so fast, right, and at a really high clock, right, um, it, it actually exhausts in 10 minutes on the 2 gigahertz PC, right? So this gigahertz, right, means, right, we have a giga, uh, um, 2 gig, right, in, per second right, that is being produced, right? So it can exhaust in 10 minutes on this 2 gigahertz per second PC, right, if we just generate the numbers, right, and um, we can get this generator, right, but again, it's not recommended. And the place a seed module, right, you can use the seed module from the elements panel in your model to, to use that specific generator. But instead of doing that, you're much better off just using current arena random ge number generator. And so, in some ways, I mentioned earlier, it, it is related to the la uh, linear congruential generators um, because it basically uses very similar ideas as LCG. Uh, so, we still have the modular division recursive on earlier values, but it's not an LCG, right? And so, uh, what it helps to produce is actually helps us to get a longer cycle lens because it combines two separate component generators. And so because of this combination of two separate component generators, it becomes a much larger incursion. So recursion, uh, sorry, recursion. Recursion involves more than just the preceding values. And so we combine multiple recursive generator, right? So this combined multiple recursive generator is used as a current arena random number generator. And so uh, the way it is built is basically using this formula below that you see. So where we, we start with two 
uh, streams AN and BN, right? So we have two simultaneous recursions. So you can see this, these are very large numbers. You can see this is the uh, very large modular division here and another very large modular division uh, for the sequence BN. And on top of that, on top of that it uses two, right? It do doesn't just only use a single previous value. It uses two values, previous values. And so it helps, right, reduce the, um, you know, or increase the length and um, make sure that we don't wrap around too fast or cycle too fast. And so we then, from the AN and BN uh, recursions, we get ZN number as AN minus BN, right, and then again modules this huge number here right again and so what it allows us to do right is then we can use the n to produce the uh, random number u sub n and this is produced using this formula right so if the n is more than zero we get this right and it's this if the n is equals to zero right so again because we're combining the two very long sequences uh, right it actually helps increase dramatically increase the length uh, cycle length of this uh, random number generator so this is how the next random number is produced right it's based on the ZN that it uses two simultaneous recursions AN and BN and so in order to do that, we actually need a six vector of first three ANs and BNs, right? Because here you can see that this is N minus two, the previous, right? And this is N minus three. Uh, so to produce the N, we need to know uh, the previous values, right? Um, was A N minus one, M N minus two, A N minus three. Right, so these three values. And to produce Bn, we need Bn minus 1 and Bn minus 3, but in between there is also n minus 2. Right, so again, we need all three values because for the next one, we're using that Bn minus 2 and Bn to get Bn plus 1. Right, so it's always those three for Bn and three for An. Right, so all together is going to give us a six values that we need to use as our seed. And so now, right, if you look at our current, uh, and by current I mean 2,000 two, uh, um, arena random number generator, uh, it has some good properties, right? So first of all, extremely good statistical properties. It has good uniformity in up to 45 dimensional hypercube, right? So what we looked before, as I showed you for the two example, we just had, right, the um, two-dimensional, right, uh, not really even quite a cube, <laughs> right, but if you were talking about the hypercube, it's two-dimensional, uh, right, squares, that we looked at the squares, right, it doesn't really have such a great uniformity, but this current arena random number generators that we just looked at, it has very good uniformity in up to 45-dimensional hypercube. And the cycle length is really huge, right? So it's 3.1 um, multiplied by 10 to the 57th, right? So compared to the linear um, congruential generators that we looked at, uh, right, that used to be used in ARENA, it was 2.1 multiplied by 10 to the 9th, right? So, so 10 to the 57th compared to 10 to the 9th, that's a quite a uh, huge improvement. And so to cycle, all C six seeds must match up. And on 2 gigahertz PC, that would take uh, 2.8 to the 10.40 uh, millennia to exhaust. So under Moore's law, it would be um, 216 years until this generator can be exhausted in a year of nonstop computing. Uh, so it's only slightly slower than old uh, linear congruential generator. And RNGs is usually just a minor part of overall computing time in, in simulations. So again, right, if you talk about streams and substreams, it has some mathematics streams and substreams, 
and we have 1.8 uh, multiplied by 10 to the 19 substreams of length, 1.7 to the 10, uh, 38 each, right? So you can see that even substreams are much longer, right, than the previous one. And each stream further divided into 2.3, 10 to the 15 substreams of length, 7.6, and multiplied by 10, 20, uh, to the 22nd each. And so 2 gigahertz PC would take 669 million years to exhaust a substream. And so default stream is 10, right, for, for historical reasons. It's also used for a chance type decide module. So to use a different stream, you can append its number after a distribution's parameters. For example, right, we typically use, when we use exponential distribution, we only use a single parameter, right, a mean for the exponential distribution. Here, right, if you also add the second parameter, 4, it actually tells to use, right, the arena to use the fourth substream. And when using multiple replications, arena automatically advances to the next substream in each stream for next replication. Uh, so that helps synchronize for variance reduction. And we'll discuss more of variance reduction, as I promised, later. Uh, so now let's talk about generating random variates, right? Not just uniform random numbers, but pretty much uh, um, ra various random variables. So we have a desired input distribution for our model that are specified in some, some way. And we have some random number generator, right? So this random number generator allows us to generate... Uh, Values from the uniform distribution, right, from 0 to 1. So what we actually want is we want to transform the uniform 0, 1 random numbers into draws from some desired input distribution. So there are several methods that exist, right, and, and the method typically is to mathematical transformation of random numbers so that we can deform them to our desired distribution. So specific transform depends on desired distribution. And also, you know, you can see more details online um, in the help about methods for all different distributions. So again, right, it doesn't, it not is the same exactly uh, when we do discrete versus continuous distributions. So we do discrete and continuous distributions separately. Uh, so let's talk first about generating from discrete distributions. So here an example, right? We have a probability mass function and it's given by this formula. So we have point, uh, 0.1 when x is negative 2, we have point 0.5 when x is 0, we have point 0.4 for x equals 3. So what we actually have is at minus 2, right? So here uh, is some type of draw, drawing, right? A plot for the PMF. Right, of course, uh, right, we don't really have this uh, length, but instead we just have points here. At minus 2, we have a point. At 0, we have a point, right, mass point. And at 3, we have another mass point here, right? So this point at minus 2 corresponds to a uh, value of uh, 0 0.1. The, po the point at uh, 0 corresponds to 0 0.5. And then at 3, we have 0 0.4 on the uh, uh, vertical axis. And so now the way to do that is we can just divide the interval from 0 to 1 into subintervals of length 0, 1, 0, 5, and 0, 4. And then generate a uniform uh, random number, right, or, or, or just a random number using the random generator. And then we can see um, in which of the subintervals it's, it's in, right? If it's between 0 and 0 0.1, then, right, it corresponds to this, x equals to minus 2. If it's between 0, 1 and 0 0.6, right, then it's x equals 0. And if it falls, you know, more than 0 0.6, right, up to 1, then it's, it's 3, right? So it returns corresponding, right? value, x is basically the corresponding value. So here is exactly what I just explained, right? We split this interval from 0 to 1. We split it into uh, different intervals, right? So the first one is of 0, 1. So it's from 0 to 0, 1. 
The next one is of length 0 0.5. And this is from 0, 1, right? Because we already used this. We, it, they cannot intersect those intervals, right? Because otherwise, if, we, if they intersect, we, didn't, we wouldn't know which x that would correspond. So from 0, 1 to 0, 0.5, right? This length of 0, 0.5. From 0, 0.1 to 0, 0.6, this length of 0, 0.5. Right, this interval is corresponding to x equals 0. Right? So any random number that falls here would produce x equals 0. And then, last but not least, right, from 0 0.6 to 1, we have a length of 0 0.4. And any random number that falls here right, will produce x equals 3. And in fact, it's very easy to see that, that would, right, the numbers were produced with this probability mass function. So now we can also take a look at this uh, example of discrete generation from another viewpoint. Um, so we could plot cumulative distribution function, then generate a random variable, and plot on vertical axis and read across and down. So here, right, if you look at this, right, again, I just plotted that previous example, right, of our distribution. So from minus 2 to 0, right, it's, it's 0 0.1. Then from uh, 0 to um, x equals 3, right, this is our cumulative distribution. So we have 6. And uh, then from 3, right, we, uh, we have 1. So, so now, right, we generate from 0 to 1, again, the random number, right, we plot that on the vertical axis. So if u is our random number and u is falls here, right, this is where it's plotted, right, then we draw a line horizontally until we reach, right, where it falls in between, right, so it's right here at x equals 3. And so in reality, that corresponds to inverting um, the cumulative distribution function, and it's basically equivalent to the earlier method that we described. So now let's talk about generating uh, variates, random variates from continuous distribution. So here is our example uh, where we have a distribution that's exponential with uh, parameter 5, and so our uh, density, our probability density function, and our, of course the uh, cumulative density, uh, sorry, cumulative distribution function are given here, right? So this is density for the exponential with mean 5, and here is the cumulative distribution function. And so a general algorithm, right, and again, right, it can be more rigorously justified, is uh, to first Generate a random number, again, from the uniform distribution from 0 to 1. And then set a uniform number equals to fx, right? So set this equation, right, our u equals to fx, and then solve it for x. And so if you solve it for x, it's the same as f to the minus 1, right? So this is actually inverting, right? So this f to the minus 1 means in um, inverse function to the function capital F, right? So it's inverse function to our CDF. And then we can solve this analytically for X, uh, but it may or may not be simple, right? And sometimes may not be possible, um, depending on how difficult this cumulative distribution function is. Um, so instead, right, sometimes we could just use uh, numerical approximations, right, to solve that. And so that's an alternative way to do that. Uh, so again, right, um, solution for the exponential um, uh, was parameter 5 case. We setting the uniform, right, fx to 1 minus uh, e, right, which is a, a natural exponent, um, to the x over 5. And that's from the previous formula, right? So you can see here, right, for x more than 0, we have exactly this. So that's what we're using, right? So we're setting it to this. That's, of course, for x more than 0. If we got an x that's not more than 0, right, that it wouldn't be uh, correct. So now we have 
right? If you're solving this, right, this is the same as just moving this negative e to the x minus 5 to the, uh, to the left, right, with the plus, and then moving the u with the minus, right, so this is what we get by solving it, right, and of course it's not the end, then we take the natural logarithm from both sides, and so that takes care of this exponent, but then we have natural logarithm of 1 minus u, so that's exactly what we see, and then we get rid of minus um, one-fifths, and so that gives us, right, the 5 here was a negative so we get x equals negative 5, um, natural logarithm of 1 minus u. And so if, right, we looked at it in terms of um, the plot, right, we could also use the inverting of cumulative distribution function, just like we did that in the discrete case. And so, right, this is a plot of um, our fx, which is a cumulative distribution function for our distribution, right, exponential was... Uh, mean parameter of 5, and then if we uh, draw some u, right, let's say it falls here, right, we plot it on the vertical um, axis, and then, right, we find the corresponding point here on the, on the line, right, by uh, going horizontally, right, until we reach the curve, right, we find the point, point corresponding, and then finding what it's... Um, x coordinate is, right, and this gives us the x. And so again, right, this is a simple uh, intuition, right, more um, UIs will hit fx where it's steep, um, this is where the density f of x is tallest, and we want a denser distribution of the axis. Um, so, we could also use this, right, or we can also talk about non-stationary Poisson processes. Right, so many systems, as we talked about earlier, um, some lectures before, have external originating events, right, that are affecting them. An example is arrivals of customers, right? Like, if, as we mentioned earlier, if uh, it's uh, lunchtime, right, more customers are arriving versus to sometimes in between, right, but not as many people would uh, want to get a lunch, for example. And... If process is stationary over time, usually specify a fixed inter um, event time distribution. But the process could vary markedly in, in its rate. Right, so as I mentioned earlier, fast food lunch rush, freeway rush hours. So if we were to ignore this non stationarity, right, a, our model would not really be valid. Right, and it would lead to serious output errors. Um, so we already seen this, right? If you look at the enhanced call center in models 5.2 and 5.3. Um, and so here we can actually define the non-stationary Poisson process. So the typical model, right, is to look at non-stationary Poisson process um, as having a rate function, right? So rather than this, uh, just some value, we have a rate function that depends on t, and then we have the number of events, right, in the time interval from t sub 1 to t sub 2, uh, would be Poisson with some mean, right, and the mean is given by, right, this inter integral um, on the interval from t1 to t2 of this rate function lambda of t, dt, and so if you look at this visually, right, and draw, right, the arrivals uh, process, then you can see, right, that sometimes, right, recall that integral is actually the area under the curve, right? So if this is our uh, lambda t, right, this is a curve of lambda t, the rate function, and then this, right, if we have the some value from t1 to t2, right, we'll get... This interval. So the issues that arise, right, is first of all how to estimate the rate function. And then another issue is that given an estimate, how to generate during simulation. And, and so again, right, estimation of rate function, right, is probably most practical method for us to use is piecewise constant 
Um, and so we decide on time interval within which the rate is fixed. And then we estimate from data, right, and get the constant rate during each interval. Um, and again, it's important, though, to get the units right. And so if, we, again, we plot this uh, rate function, arrival rate function lambda uh, t here, right, in the dotted line, then we can approximate it, right, for each interval, right, we can split things on the interval and then get this constant rate, right, which is from the points that we observe, right, we just get the average of those points, right, again, here's our observed points, we get the average, we put the constant line, and so on, right. So, of course, there's other more complicated methods that exist in the literature, but this is one of the more practical and simpler method. And another advantage of this method is that it can be easily implemented, as you see in the arena, uh, by using the arrival schedules. Right? So, again, right, when we want to generate non stationary Poisson processes, we can use ARENA, right, that has a built-in method to generate these type of processes, assuming a piecewise constant rate function. And so we use arrival schedule, right, and we use it in create module. And so I already showed that how to do that when we looked at models 5.2 and 5.3. So if you look at the methods, right, the method is basically is to invert a rate one stationary Poisson process against cumulative rate function lambda, right? That's what ARENA uses for this generation of, of non-stationary Poisson processes. And that's actually very similar to inverting the cumulative distribution function for continuous random variable generation. And basically it exploits the same speed up possibilities. And if you want to uh, learn more details, right, can be found in a help topic on non-stationary exponential distribution. So alternative method, right, is to thin um, stationary Poisson processes at peak rate, right? And thinning means, you know, just uh, reducing the uh, and not accepting some of the values that are generated. And so now let's talk about variance reduction, as I promised before. Uh, so as you know, right, random input um, produces random output. And so we have this uh, reroll rule. And in other words, output has some kind of variance, right? The random means there is some kind of variance. And so the higher output variance means less precise results. So typically, right, what we used to do is we, we could run, right, more replications to get more precise re result, right? But we also would like to eliminate or reduce output variance, right? Another a very bad way to eliminate it is replace all input red, random variables by constants, like zero mean. But of course, you know, that really doesn't represent all the variability, right? It just gets rid of all variability uh, altogether, right? So it's not a good way to go. Um, because, right, even though it gets rid of random output, it also makes the um, model invalid. So, uh, therefore, our best hope is to just reduce output variance. And there is an easy uh, brute force variance reduction method, right, just simulate some more, right, and that's what we used before. In particular, right, in terminating, right, we used um, more replications, so we, we added additional replications to, to our simulation. In the steady state, right, we have either additional replications or uh, we did longer runs, right, so it was another thing that we did. Um, so, of course, right, there, the, that was sometimes problematic, right, because it might take much longer to, per, to, to run our simulation. So some of the methods to, to do is to use some other variance reduction things. Um, so again, sometimes we can reduce variance without more runs, right? So again, question is this free lunch. It's not completely a free lunch, uh, but you know, it, it's actually almost a free lunch, right? If you use it in a smart way. So the key here is unlike physical experiments, we can actually control randomness in computer simulation experiments. 
And this can be done by manipulating this random number generator algorithm. So we could reuse the same random numbers, either as they were, or in some opposite sense, or for a similar by simpler model. So there are different, several different variance reduction techniques that exist, and they basically classified into categories, common random numbers, antithetic variates, control variates, indirect estimation, and so on. So these usually requires uh, a thorough understanding of a model and the code and we'll look only at common random numbers um, in detail. So let's let's talk about a common uh, random numbers, um, and this is one of the ways to um, do variance reduction. And uh, this, this uh, method applies when objective is to compare two or more alternative configurations or models. Um, and interest is in differences on performance measures across alternatives. So example is model 7.2 of uh, looked at its small manufacturing system. And there we had total average work in process output for two different alternatives. Um, the base case, where we just had the system the way it is, and uh, the second case where we had 3.5% increase in, uh, in, in uh, business, basically in arrival time mean falls from 13 to 12.56 minutes. And so we could uh, use same same right conditions by change model um, this model from 7.2 to 12.1 um, and we could remove output file uh, from um, the model 7.2 um, so we remove the output file that we had total working uh, process history dot dot and then we could add entry to statistic module to compute and save to a dot dot file total average work in process on each replication. So if 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 we do that, um, that actually gives us a natural comparison. We can run case A, make changes to get the case B, and then run it. And then we could use compare means via um, output analyzer. So doing all that would produce this right so it's very similar to what we have already done when we looked at how to compare means via output analyzer so i'm not gonna demonstrate this but you can recognize right that what you got is this uh, parity comparison uh, for the means between the two alternatives where it takes a difference right between um, different outputs and then constructs the confidence interval the 95 percent confidence interval on it and so you can see, right, that this is the um, mean for the interval, right? This is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side. And so zero falls into this interval. So if we did that, right, uh, we, we would see that zero falls into the confidence interval. So what that means, it means that we could not really, um, right, say that the two cases are distinct Right, significant, statistically significantly uh, different uh, because in this case we actually fail to reject the uh, null hypothesis right and and the null hypothesis is that the means are the same right um, so at 0.5 percent uh, 0 0.05 percent level um, sorry not percent 0.05 level or 5 percent level we cannot uh, say that means are not equal and uh, because in this case this difference is not statistically significant, right? We need to think in terms of right uh, whether it really is the case, right? Because uh, even though we we get this result, right, the runs of A and B, right, were were possibly statistically independent, right? Another question, did we use the same random numbers running NAB, 
right? We didn't use the same random numbers running in AB, so the variability could be due to significant um, variability in terms of the simulations, right? Did we use the same random numbers intelligently? So the intuition for the common random numbers is to be able to get the sharper comparisons uh, if your subject uh, all alternatives to the same conditions, right? Because before, when we did this example, right, if, if you would do this example, that doesn't really, right, the variability might be the reason why, right, uh, we couldn't, we weren't able to compare or we weren't able to conclude that there is a difference in, in the means. So if we get uh, a sharper comparison, we would be able to um, really reduce some of that variability, right? And so that's what I want to show you. So then we observe differences, right? The, if we reduce the variability in the random number generator, then the observed differences would be due to the model differences rather than the random uh, differences in conditions. And so in terms of the small manufacturing system, right, for both A and B runs, Right, this would cause the same parts arrive at the same times and be assigned to the, the same attributes or job types. Also have the same process times at each step. So in that case, right, then ob observed differences would be attributable to system differences and not just a random uh, bounds. So there isn't any ra any more uh, any random bounds, right? If we um, did right all of these things right if we um made sure that things are the same right for the different runs um so again uh, let's take a look at the synchronization of random numbers in the common random numbers methods so generally if we get common random numbers by using the same random number generators the same seed and the same streams for all alternatives uh, so already are using the same stream because the default stream is used, and that's stream 10. But its usage generally gets mixed up across alternatives, and so that could cause that random bounce that I talked about. And, and so we must use the same random numbers for the same purposes across alternative scenarios. And that will um, ensure the synchronization of random number use. So usually that requires some work and also understanding of the model and where you know the uh, random numbers are used. Um, also usually use different streams in the random number generator um, and usually different ways to do this in a given model. So sometimes you can't synchronize completely for some very complex models, so you might settle for partial synchronization. Um, so you could synchronize by source of randomness, and that's what we'll do. Um, and we'll assign stream to each point of variant generation. We also separate random number uh, faucets um, or extra parameters in random uh, variable calls. So in the model 12.1, you could have uh, we could actually identify 14 sources of randomness. We have separate streams for each. Right, you could see textbook for a reading textbook for more details and then you can modify this in the model 12 too uh, which is fairly simple but might not ensure complete synchronization so still usually get some kind of benefit from doing uh, all this another thing is we could do all right but we're not going to do here is we could synchronize by entity and so you should look into exercises to see, uh, you know, how this can be done or applied. Uh, and the way to synchronize by entity is to pre-generate every possible random variant an entity might need when it arrives, then assign to attributes used downstream. And of course, this kind of method achieves much better synchronization insurance, but it also requires much more memory. Um, so another thing we could do is uh, cross-replications or random number generator 
automatically goes to next upstream or each stream. And so that kind of stuff maintains synchronization if alternatives disagree on number of random numbers used per stream and per replication. So if we did uh, some of that, right, what would be the effect of using the common random numbers? Well, actually, the effect could be quite significant. And so here you can see that the output analyzer screen where it illustrates the effect of uh, common random numbers. So on top here, you could see the natural uh, comparison between the two alternatives, the case A and the B. And you can see how large the um, confidence interval is, right? So this is a confidence interval on the difference between the uh, two, two outputs, right? Or the same output, the total average total working process, but for two cases, actually. And then in the bottom, what you see is much smaller, much shorter, confidence interval, and that's an interval produced using the synchronized uh, common random numbers. So in this case, again, we compared two cases, case A and case B, right, those modified models 7, 2 of small manufacturing system that were modified into model um, 12, 2. And so here, what we see is much, much smaller, shorter interval. And so this interval is now only includes, right, some of the, you know, uh, so the differences that it includes would only be due to, right, the differences between the models themselves. There's still the randomness, right, because it's not just a single number, it's an interval. But, right, to reduce some of that extraneous randomness, that it's just basically a noise. And now we got a much smaller interval. And what's important is that while in the first case, when we just did the natural comparison without synchronizing and using the common random numbers, our conclusion was is that we cannot reject the hypothesis that the mean, uh, the two means are the same, right? That the two mean in the case, two means the mean in the case of no uh, changes in the model, and then there was the changes in the model where we have more business it's still going to give us a total, the same total work in process, right? That's based on, right, in, on the, in the mean. That's based on, on this uh, top comparison. In the bottom comparison, right, we have the synchronized, where we have the synchronized common random numbers. Now, this conclusion is that we uh, have different means. There's statistically significant difference because zero right, is outside of the confidence interval, there is a statistically significant difference between the two cases. And so we can clearly see that the common random numbers, right, and using the, them in the intelligent way can actually help us distinguish, right, just the random noise part from real differences in the models. And so again, right, you can see that in the output analyzer screen, right, in the first case, the means are equal, right, in the second case, means are not equal at 0 0.05 level. So again, natural comparison versus synchronized uh, common random numbers, right, and you can see also that the common uh, random numbers didn't, ha didn't require much more computational effort, and the effect here is uh, fairly dramatic, but it will not always be this strong, right? So again, it depends on how similar or different um, the cases are or the alternatives, your alternatives are. Uh, so let's discuss some of the statistical issues for common random numbers. So in the output analyzer, you can go analyze, compare means option. You have a cho choice for of um, parity and the two sample T for confidence interval test on difference between the means. And using the parity, right, it actually subtracts the results replication by replication. So we must use this if we're doing common random numbers. The two sample t, treat samples independently, right, 
can use this as doing independent sampling, often better than parity. So it's very important to keep this in mind, right? The parity, if doing uh, common random numbers should be used, the two sample t test should be used if doing independent sampling, right? And I've often better than parity. So let's talk about some mathematical justification for common random number use. So let's say x is an output random uh, variable from alternative A and y an output uh, random variable from, from B. So if you look at the variance of the difference, right, of x and y, so variance of the difference between the two outputs is the variance of x plus the variance of y minus the two covariance of x and y. And so if x and y is in, are independent, this is just zero. But if we're using the common random numbers, right, then this is positive, this covariance is positive. And so v actually reducing the variance, right, by subtracting this twice covariance. And this is why, right, this is shows why uh, the common random numbers can be really useful in terms of reducing the variance. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there are other variance reduction techniques that are helpful. So for single system simulation, right, and not comparisons, we could use antithetic variates and make pairs of runs use um, um, random numbers, right, use on the first run of pair, and then y minus u, right, on the second run of pair. So in that case, what we actually get is uh, u and then 1 minus u. We can to then take average of two runs. These two variables, as you can see, are negatively correlated, right? They're exactly uh, correlated with negative uh, equal, is their correlation is equal to negative 1. And so that reduces uh, variance on average. And so just like the common random numbers, we must take care, right, to synchronize. Um, the another method uh, that is used for variance reduction is control variates. And there we use internal variate generation to control the results up or down, right? And then also another method uh, is indirect estimation. And there are simulation estimates some something uh, other than what you want, but uh, something that is related to what you actually want to estimate. Um, and it's related, it's important that it's related by some fixed formula. Another method is a sequential sampling. So it always, right, we always try to quantify imprecision in results. And if imprecision is small enough, then we're basically done. But if it's not, then something needs to be done to increase the precision. So we just saw one of the way to do it, right, by using the variance reduction technique. Uh, another way is to increase precision is to keep simulating one more step at a time and then stop when we achieve a desired precision. So in the terminating models, right, the step is just basically another a replication. So we can extend the length of replications, right, because that's already a part of the model in the terminating models. In the steady state models, the step is equal to another replication if using truncating replications, right? Because in truncated replications, again, right, can't really extend the length. Or the step could be some extension of the single run if you're using batch means. And so let's take a look at the terminating uh, models, right? Um, for example, we could modify model 12.2, which are small manufacturing system. Uh, we could look at the base case with the random number streams. And I can modify that in the model 12.3, uh, which I want you to look at the example uh, of these models in, in the book. Um, so we could make 25 replication, get 95% confidence interval on expected average total work in the process. And what we're going to get is we're going to get this confidence interval as 13.03 plus minus 1.28, right? So the left uh, hand side, this was a minus and the uh, right hand side was a plus. 
So suppose that this half width of 1.28 is just too, too large for us, right? And we want to reduce it significantly so that it's only uh, 0 0.5, right? So how can we reduce this half width for our confidence interval? Right. We could use approximate formulas right, that we learned earlier. Remember in the section when we discussed the material from section 6.3, right, we used two different formula, formulas and basically depending on which formulas we use, right, we could either need 124 simulations or 164 total replications right, um, instead of the 25 replications. So instead, we can just make one more at a time and then recompute the confidence interval and stop as soon as the half width is less than 0 0.5, right? Because typically what we did is if we have those two different numbers, 124 and 164, we just get the largest one of the two and then run that long. And then it still might not produce it, right, what we desire. So instead, right, we can just make one more at a time, recompute the confidence interval, right, and then be able to stop, right, without making any extra replications. And so the trick, right, is in Arena is to keep making more replications until the confidence interval half width is less some kind of tolerance tolerance level. In our case, right, in our example, that would be 0 0.5, but it could be set to any anything that you want. Uh, whatever your desired uh, half width is. So again, let's take a look at here, right? Recall that with more than one replication, we automatically get the cross replication 95% confidence interval for expected values in category of review report. There's also related internal arena variables. And these are um, this O run half for the output ID. And that basically gives us a half width of 95% confidence interval using completed replications. Um, and in that case, we could choose output ID average total of work in process for our um, model. We could also use uh, MREP, and MREP represents the total number of replications that's um, asked for. And so initially, you could set up mrep equals to the number of applications in the run setup replication parameters. And there's also nrep. nrep is the replication number uh, that's now in progress. So then you know the mrep, right? mrep is the number that you indicated in the replication parameters. The nrep is your current replication number. Then you can look and compare those two, right, to increase, right, the M, M rep, right? So you can use and manipulate these, all these three variables, right, the M rep, N rep, and the O run half. So again, right, we can initially set the M rep to some huge value in number of replications, right, in the run setup replication parameters. We can keep replicating until we cut off when the half width is less or equal than 0 0.5. And we can also add logic in the submodel to sense when, when we are done. So we can create one control entity at the beginning of each replication. The control entity immediately checks to see right, if the end rep, right, the current number of replication, is less than 2. Right? This is beginning of the first or second replication. Then the O run half, right, of the average total work in process is more than 0 0.5, right, which is the uh, confidence interval on completed replication, right, is still too big. So in either case, we keep going with this a replication, right, and the next one too, and the control entity is disposed, right, and basically takes no action. So if both conditions are false, then control entity can assign the MRAP to the end wrap to stop after this replication, right? And then it's disposed. So details, right? This overshoots required number of replications, but just one. In the sign module, if we set M wrap to end wrap to have to select the type equals other since M wrap is a built-in arena variable. 
And then the results would be um, stopped was 232 total replications, and then yielding the half was of 4. Point, um, sorry, 0. 0.49699, right? So it's almost almost 0. 0.5. And again, they're right, different from earlier number of replication approximations. And there could be some generalization for like precision demands on several outputs or relative width stopping where we divide half widths uh, by the um, point estimate. And we can also do the sequential sampling for the steady state models. And if we do in truncated replications approach, to steady state statistical analysis, we could use the same strategy as, as before for terminating models. Um, we could specify the warm up period that uh, we have in the run setup replication parameters. Uh, so we want to err on um, the side of too much warm up uh, because not enough warm up can produce um, uh, a bias, and the point estimator bias is especially um, problematic and dangerous when we use sequential sampling. And getting a tight confidence interval centered in the wrong place uh, can be quite, quite uh, problematic because it could completely take you, you know, um, in the wrong area and give you a wrong result um, and have a very uh, large effect on, on your um, values. And so the tighter the confidence interval demanded, uh, the worse the coverage probability. Um, so in terms of the batch means approach, um, we could uh, change it into model 12.4, which is a modification of model 7.4, uh, again, where we had the small, small manufacturing system, uh, and use the batch means um, there. So we want to have with on the um, expected average work in process to be uh, less than one, and we can uh, keep extending the single run to reduce confidence intervals uh, half width. We can use automatic runtime batch means um, for 95% confidence intervals. And the stopping criteria uh, we could use in terms of a run, a run setup replication parameters in the terminating condition field. Um, we would use the half width variables uh, where we use T half uh, for tally ID or D half for D stat ID. And for us, right, uh, the condition is D, D half uh, for the total work in process. And uh, because we're using the uh, total work in process as an output and uh, that's not a tally. And so we're using D half of total work in process less than one as a condition. Um, in the terminating condition field in our replication parameters tab. And then we can remove all other stopping um, devices from the model. And if we have insufficient or correlated um, that are returned, right, that would be because of too little uh, data. They have with variables set to some huge value, right, so it could keep going. And uh, we could demand multiple um, smallness criteria or relative precision um, using T average and D average variables for um, the uh, point estimate uh, denominator. And so um, when we're talking about the experiment design, we can uh, design and execute simulation experiments. Uh, so we could actually think of simulation model as a convenient um, test bed or laboratory for experimentation, right? A digital laboratory for experimentation. And, and so we could look at different output responses, um, also compare um, different effects, interaction of different input factors, and see um, what impact they play on output. Um, so in that case, 
Um, it's very useful to use classical experimental design techniques, including factorial experiments, where we could uh, look at main effects and interactions um, of the effects and see what impact they have on uh, specified outputs. Also, um, introduce fractional factorial experiments um, to explore uh, additional number of larger number of effects um, and also looked at factor screening designs and uh, meta models such as response surface methods. Um, we can also use common random numbers, right? And uh, in that case, the common random numbers would represent the blocking in experimental design terminology. And then the process <coughs> analyzer provides a very convenient way for us to carry out the design experiment. So that concludes our um, last lecture. Thank you very much.